Ashley Brock reading my Nora Roberts book, Rising Tides, Chapter 2. There was nothing like a Saturday, unless it was the Saturday leading up to the last week of school and to summer vacation. That, of course, was all the Saturdays of your life rolled into one big shiny ball. Saturday meant spending the day out on the work boat with Ethan and Jim instead of in a classroom. It meant hard work and hot sun and cold drinks. Man, stuff! With his eyes sh shaded under the bill, the Zoyo's cap, and the really cool sunglasses he bought on a trip to the mall, Seth shot out the gap to drag in the next marker buoy. His young muscles bunched under his X-Files t-shirt, which assured him that the truth was out there. He watched Jim work, tilt the pot, and unhook the oyster can lid, stop her to the bait box on the bottom of the boat, shake out the old bait Seth noted, and see the seagulls dive and scream like maniacs. Cool! Now get a good solid hold on the pot, turn it over, shake it like crazy so the crab's in it. So the crabs in the upstairs section fall out into the wash tub waiting for them. Seth figured he could do all that if he really wanted to. He wasn't afraid of a bunch of stupid crabs just because they looked like big mutant bugs from Venus had claws that tended to snap and pinch. Said his job was to rebate the pot with a couple handfuls of disgusting fish parts, do the stopper, check to make sure there were no snags in the land, eyeball the distance between markers, and if everything looked good, toss the pot overboard. Splash! Then he got the toss off the golf for the next buoy. He knew how to tell the sock six from the jimmies now. Jim said the girl crabs painted their fingernails because their pinchers were red. It was wild the way the patterns of the underbellies looked like sex parts. Anybody could see that the guy crabs had this long T shape there that looked just like a dick. <laughs> Jim had showed him a couple crabs mating too. He called them doublers, and that was just too much. The guy, the guy crab just climbed aboard the girl, tucked her under him, and swam around like that for days. Seth figured they had to like it. Ethan had said the crabs were married, and when Seth had snickered, he lived with a bro. Seth had found himself intrigued enough to go to school library and read about up on crabs, and he thought he understood sort of what Ethan meant. The guy protected the girl by keeping her under him, because she could only mate when she was in her last molt, and her shell was soft, so she was vulnerable. Even after they'd done it, he kept carrying her like that until her shell was hard again, and she was only going to mate once, so it was like getting married. He thought of how Cam and Miss Smelling, Anna, he reminded himself, he got to call her Anna now, had gotten married. Lots of the women got all leaky, and the guys laughed and joked. Every man, but he made such a big deal out of it with flowers and music and tons of food. He didn't get it. It seemed... To him, getting married just meant you get, got to have sex whenever you wanted, and nobody got snotty about it. But it had been cool. He'd never been to anything like it. Even though Cam had dragged him out to the mall and made him try on suits, it was mostly okay. Maybe sometimes he worried about how it was going to change the things just when he was getting used to the way things were. There was going to be a woman in the house now. He liked Anna, okay? She played square with him, even though she was a social worker. But she was still a female, like his mother. So it clamped down on that thought. If he thought about his mother, if he thought about the life he'd had with her, the men, the drugs, the dirty little rooms, would spoil the day. He hadn't had enough sunny days in his ten years to risk ruining them one. You taking a nap there, Seth? You taking a nap there, nap there, Seth? Ethan's mild voice snapped Seth back to the moment. He blinked, saw the sun glaring out of the water. The orange floats popping. Just thinking. Seth muttered and quickly pulled in another boy. Me, I don't do much thinking. Jim set the trap on the gold wing. Me and curling crabs. So the face ceased and grins. Gives you brain fever. Shit, Seth said leading over to his catch. That's once that once started to mulch. Jim grunted. Held up a crab with a shell cracking along the back. This buster will be somebody's soft shell sandwich by tomorrow. He winked at Seth as he tossed crab into the tank. Maybe mine. Foolish, she was still young enough to deserve the name, sniffed at the tra trap, indicating a quick and ugly crab riot. His claws snapped. The pup leaped back with a yelp. That there dog, Jim shook his shook his laugh. He don't have to worry about no brain fever. Even when they'd taken the day's catch to the waterfront, emptied the tank and dropped Jim off for the day wasn't over. He just stepped back from the controls. We've got to go into the boatyard. You want to take her in? Though Seth's eyes were shielded by the dark sunglasses, Ethan imagined their surprise matched the boy's dropped jaw. It only amused him when Seth jerked his shoulder, as if such stakes were an everyday occurrence. Sure, no problem. With sweaty palms, Seth took the helm. Ethan stood by, hands casually tucked in his back pockets, eyes alert. There was plenty of water traffic. There was plenty of water traffic. A pretty weekend afternoon drew the recreational sailors to the bay, but they didn't have far to go, and the kid had to learn sometime. He couldn't live in St. Chris and not know how to pilot a workboat.
a little to starboard, he told him. See that skiff there? Sunday sailor, and he's going to cut right across your bow if you keep this heading. Seth narrowed his eyes, studied the boat and the people in the dark. He snorted. That's because he's paying more attention to that girl in the bikini than to the wind. Well, she looks fine in the bikini. I don't see what's the big deal about breasts. To his credit, Ethan didn't laugh out loud, but not at all. I guess part of that's because we don't have them. I sure don't want any. Give it a couple of years. Ethan murmured under the cover of the engine noise. The sight of that made him wince. What the hell were they going to do when the kid hit puberty? Somebody was going to have to talk to him about. Thanks. He knew Seth already had too much sexual knowledge, but it was all the dark and sticky sort. Same sort of he himself known about as many as many at much too early an age. One of them was going to have to explain how things should be, could be, before too much more time passed. He hoped the hell wasn't going to have to be him. Caught sight of the boatyard, the old brick building, the spanky new dock he and his brothers had built. Pride ripples through him. Maybe it didn't look like much with its pitted bricks and patch roof, but they were more. They were making something out of it. The windows were dusty, but they were new and unbroken. Cut back on the throttle. Take her in slow. Absolutely, Ethan put a hand over Seth on the control. Felt the boy stiffen, then relaxed. It's all the problem with people touching, being touched unexpectedly. Ethan nodded, but it was passing. That's the way. Just a bit more to starboard. When the boat bumped gently against the pillars, Ethan jumped on the pier of Scarlet Line. Nice job. As now, Simon all but quivered with anticipation, leaped overboard, yipping frantically. Foolish clambered onto the gone wheel, hesitated to fall. Hit me up the cool, Seth. Gotten only a little, said Ethan. Maybe I could pilot the boat sometime when we're crabbing. Maybe. Ethan waited for the boy to scramble safely onto the pier before heading to the rear cargo doors of the building. They were already open wide, and the soul steering sound of Ray Charles flowed out through them. He and set the cold down just inside the doors, put his hands on his hips. The little hall was finished. Came and put in dog's hours to get that much done before he left for his honeymoon. They planked it. Wrapped it to the edges so that there would lap, yet remain smooth at the seams. Two of them had completed the seam bent framing, using pencil lines as guides and walking each frame carefully into place with slow, steady pressure. The hull was solid. There would be no splints in a Quinn boat's planking. Design was primarily Ethan's with a few adjustments here and there of cams. The hull was an arched bottom, expensive to construct, but with the virtuals. Virtues of stability and speed, Ethan knew his client. He designed the shape of the bow with this in mind and had decided on a cruiser bow. Bow, attractive and again, good for speed. Buoyant, the stern was a counter design of modern length, provided an overhang that would make the boat's length greater than her waterline length. It was sleek, appealing looking. Ethan, used, Ethan understood that his client was every bit as concerned with appearance as he was with basic seaworthiness. He used Seth for grunt labor when it was time to coat the interior with the 50-50 mix of hot linseed oil and turpentine. It was sweaty work, guaranteeing to cause a few burns despite caution and gloves. Still, the boy had help, held up fine. From where he stood, Ethan could study the steer, shear line, the outline of outline at the top edge of the hole. He'd gone with a flattered shear line to ensure a roamier, dry, drier craft with good headroom below. His kind liked to take friends and family out for a sale. The man had insisted on a teak. Had insisted on teak. Though Ethan had told him Pine or Cinder would have done the job well enough for hole planking. The man had money to spend on his hobby. Ethan thought now, and money to spend on status. But he had to admit the teak looked wonderful. His brother Philip was working on the decking, stripped to the waist in defensive in defense against the heat and humidity, his dark bronze hair protected by black cap without team name or emblem or build to the back, he was screwing the deck planks into place. Every few seconds, the hard, high-pitched buzz of the electric drill competed with Ray Charles' screaming tender. How's it going? Ethan called over the den. Phelps' head came up. He, his martyred angel's face was damp with sweat, his golden brown eyes annoyed. He'd just been reminding himself that he was snapping, touching the sector, and for God's sake, not a carpenter. It's hotter than summer in hell in here, and it's only June. We've got to get some fans in here. You got anything cold or at least wet in that cooler? I ran out of liquids an hour, liquids an hour ago. Turn on the tap in the john and get you water. Ethan said mildly. He's meant to take a cold soft drink from the cold. It's a new technology. Christ knows what's in that tap water. Philip caught, caught the can. Ethan tossed him and grimaced at the limo. 
at least they tell you what chemicals they load in here. Sorry, we drink all. Sorry, we drank all the Avion. You know how Jim is about his designer water. Can't get enough of it. Screw you. Felt sad, but without heat. He glugged the chili Pepsi and raised a brow when Easy came out. Came up to inspect his work. Nice job. Gee, thanks, boss. Can I have a raise? Sure. Double what you're getting now. Says the math whiz. Was zip time zip said. Double zip! I said with a quick grin. His fingers itched to try out the electric screwdriver. So far, nobody would have let him touch it or any of the other power tools. Well, now I can afford that cruise to Tahiti. Why don't you grab a shower unless you object to washing with tap water, too? I can take over here. It was tempting. Philip was grimy, sweating miserably hot. He would cheerfully have killed three strangers for one cold glass of Poulet Pousse. But he knew Ethan had been up since before dawn and had already put in what any normal person would consider a full day. I can handle a couple more hours. Fine. It was exactly the response Ethan had expected. Philip tended to bitch, but he never let you down. I think we can get this deck knocked out before we call it a day. Can I? No. He said Philip sat together. That's a very sad question. Why the hell not? He demanded. I'm not stupid. I won't shoot anybody with a stupid screw or anything. Because we like to play with it, Philip smiled. And we're bigger than you. Here. He reached into the back pocket, pulled out his wallet, and found a file. Go on down to Crawford's and get me some bottled water. If you don't whine about it, you can keep get some ice cream with the change. Seth didn't whine, but he did mutter about being used like a slave. That's called his dog and headed out. We ought to show him how to use the tools when we have more time. He's coming. He's got good hands. Yeah, but I wanted him out. I didn't have the chance to tell you last night. The detective tracked Lord DeLautner as far as Nag's head. She sat in the south then. He looked at his gaze, Philip. You pin her yet? No, she moves around a lot and she's using cash. A lot of cash. His mouth said. She's got plenty to toss around since Dad paid her a bundle for Seth. Doesn't look... Like she's interested in coming back here. I'd say she's got as much interest in that kid as a rabbit alley cat has in a dead kitten. His own mother had been the same. Philip remembered when she'd been around at all. He had never met Glory DeLotner, but he knew her, despised her. If we don't find her, Philip had him rolling the cold can over his forehead. We're never going to get the truth about that, or said. Easy nodded. He knew Philip was on a mission here. He knew he was most likely right. But he wondered much too often for comfort what they would do when they had the truth. Ethan's plan after a 14-hour work day were to take an endless shower and drink a cold beer. He did both simultaneously. They'd gotten to take out subs for dinner, and he had his on the back porch alone. In the soft quiet of early twilight, inside, Seth and Philip were all running over which video to watch first. Arnold Schwarzenegger was doing battle with Kevin Costner. Ethan had already placed his bets on Arnold. They'd have an outspoken argument that Philip would take responsibility for Seth's. They had an outspoken agreement that Philip would take responsibility for Seth on Saturday nights. Gave Ethan a choice. For the evening, he could go in and join them, as he sometimes did for these movie fests. He can go up and settle in with a book, or, or as he often preferred to do, he could go out and go out, as he rarely did. For his father died so suddenly, and life had changed for all the all of them. Ethan had lived in his own little house, his own quiet routine. He still missed it, though he tried not to resent the young couple who were now renting it for him, from him. They loved the coziness of it and told him so often. Small rooms with their tall windows, little covered porch, the shady privacy of the trees that sheltered it, and the gentle lap of water against shore. He loved it too. With Cam Mary and Anna moving in, he might be able to slip out again, but the rental money was needed now, and more important, he'd given his word. He could live here until all the legal battles were waged and won. Seth was permanently theirs. He rocked, listening to the night birds, beginning to call. I must have dozed because the dream came, came clearly. He always were more of a loner than the others. Ray commented, he sat at the porch rail, turning slightly so he could look out to the water if he chose. His hair was shiny as a silver coin, and a half light blown free in the scenery. I always like to go off by yourself to think your thoughts and work out your troubles. I knew I could always come to you or Mom. She'd like to have handle on things first. How about now? Ray shifted face Ethan directly. I don't know. Maybe I haven't gotten a good handle on it yet. Seth's settling in. He's easier with us first few weeks. Kept expecting him to wrap it all. Losing your hurt him almost as much as it did us. Maybe just as much. Because he's just starting to believe things were okay for him. 
It was bad, the way he had to live before I bought him here. Still wasn't as bad as what you'd face, Ethan, and you got through. Almost didn't. Ethan took out one of his cigars, took his time lightning. Sometimes it still comes back to me, pain and shame. Just wasn't fear of knowing what's going to happen. Shut up. Says a little younger than I was. I think he's already shed some of it, as long as he doesn't have to deal with his mother again. He'll have to deal with her eventually, but he won't be alone. That's the difference. You all stand by him. You always stood by each other. Each other. Ray smiled his big wide face, crushing everywhere. And went, what are you doing sitting out here alone on Saturday night, Ethan? I swear, boy, you worry me. I had a long day. When I was your age, I put in long days and longer nights. You just turned 30, for Christ's sake. Porch sitting on a warm Saturday night in June. It's for old men. Go on, take a drive. See where you end up. He went. I bet we both know where that's likely to be. A sudden blare of automatic gunfire and screams made Ethan jerk in his chair. He blinked, stared hard at the porch rail. There was no one there. Of course there was no one there. Told him so. Well, quick shake. He nodded off for a minute. That was all. The movie action in the living room had wakened him. But when he glanced down, he saw the glowing cigar in his hand. Baffled. He simply stared at it. Had he actually taken it out of his pocket and lit it in his sleep? That was ridiculous. Absurd. He must have done it before he drifted it off. They have it so automatic that his mind just didn't register the moves. So, why had he fallen asleep when he didn't feel the least bit tired? In fact, he felt restless and edgy and too alert. He rose, rubbing the back of his neck, stretching legs on pacing, journey up and down the porch. He should just go in and settle down with a movie, some popcorn, and another beer. Even as he reached for the screen door, he swore he wasn't in the mood for Saturday night at the movies. He would just take a drive and see where he ended up. <laughs> Grace's feet were numb all the way to the ankles. The cursed high heels that were part of her cocktail waitress uniform were killers. It wasn't so bad on weekday evening when you had time now and then to step out of them or even sit for a few minutes. But Shiny's pup always hopped on Saturday night, and so did she. She carted her tray of empty glasses and full ashtrays to the bar, efficiently unloading as she called out her order to the bartender. Two house whites, two drafts, a gin and tonic, and a cup soda with lime. She had to pitch her voice over the crowd noise and what was loosely called music from the three-piece band Shiny had hired. The music always lousier at the pub because Shiny would shell out the money for decent musicians, but no one seemed to care. The stingy door floor, dance floor was bumper to bumper with dance, dancers, and the band took this as a sign to boost the volume. Grace's head was ringing like steel bells, and her back was beginning to throb in time with the bass. Her order, com her order complete, she carried the tray through the narrow spaces between tables and hoped that the group of young tourists in trendy clothes would be decent tippers. She served them with a smile, nodded the single around the table, and followed the hail to the next table. Her break was still minutes away. It might as well have been ten years. Hi there, Gracie. How's it going, Curtis? Bobby? She'd gone to school with him in them distant past. Now they work for her father. Packing seafood. Usual? Yeah, a couple drafts. Curtis gave Grace his usual quick pat on her bow-clad butt. She learned now to wor not worry about it. From him, it was a harmless enough gesture, even a show affectionate support. Some of the outlanders who dropped in, dropped and had hands a great deal less harmless. How's, how's that pretty girl of yours? Grace smiled, understanding that this was one of the reasons she tolerated his pets. He always asked about Harvey. Getting prettier every day. She saw another hand pop up from a nearby table. I'll get you those beers. Just a minute. She was carting a tray full of mugs, bowls of beer nuts, and glasses when Ethan walked in. She nearly bobbled it. He never came into the pub on Saturday night. Sometimes he dropped in for a quiet beer midweek. Whenever when the place was crowded and noisy, she had a look. He should have looked the same as every second man in the place. His jeans were faded but clean, a plain, plain white t-shirt tucked into them, his work boots, aging the skull. But he didn't look the same as other men, and never had the grace. Maybe it was a lean and rangy body that moved as easily as a dancer through the narrow spaces. And innate grace, <laughs> she mused, the kind that can't be taught, still so blankly male. He always looked as though he was walking the deck of a ship. He could have been, it could have been his face, so bony and rugged, and somewhere just the edges of handsome, or the eyes, always so clear and thoughtful, so serious that it seemed to take them a few seconds to catch up with whenever his mouth curved. She served her drinks, pocketed money, took more orders, and watched out of the corner of her eyes as he squeezed into a standing spot at the bar directly beside the ordering station. She followed. She forgot all about her much-desired break. 
Three drafts, bottle of Mitch, slowly on the rocks. Absently, she brushed out her bangs and smiled. Hi, Ethan. Busy tonight. Summer Saturday. Do you want a table? No, this is fine. The bartender was busy with another order, which gave her some breathing room. Steve's got his hand full, but he'll work his way down here. I'm not in any hurry. As a rule, he tried not to think about how she looked in that butt-skimming skirt, those endless legs and black fishnets, the narrow feet and skinny heels. But tonight he was in a mood, and so he let himself think, just at the moment. He could have explained and said just what the big deal was about breasts. Grace was small and high, and a soft portion of the curve showed over the low-cut bodice of her blouse. Suddenly, he desperately wanted a beer. He get a chance to sit down at all. She didn't answer for a moment. Her mind had gone glass blank. <laughs> the way those quiet, thoughtful eyes had skimmed over. I, uh, yes, it's nearly time for my break. Her hands felt clumsy as she gathered up her order. I like to go outside, get away from the noise, struggling to act normal. She rolled her eyes toward the band and was rewarded with these and slogan. Do they ever get worse than this? Oh, yeah, these guys are a real step up. She was nearly relaxed again. She looked at the tray and headed off to serve. He watched her while he sipped the beer. Stephen pulled for him, watched the way her legs moved, the way the foolish and incredibly sexy bow swayed with her hips, and the way she bent her knees, balancing the tray, lifting drinks from it onto the table. He watched, eyes narrowing. As Curtis, is, as Curtis once again gave her a friendly pat, his eyes narrowed. Further, when a stranger in a faded Jim Morrison t-shirt grabbed her hand, tugging her closer, saw Grace flash a smile, give a shake of her head. Ethan was already pushing away from the bar, not entirely sure what he intended to do when the man released her. When Grace came back to set down her tray, it was Ethan who grabbed her hand. Take your break. What? I... To her shark, he was pulling her steadily through the room. Ethan, I really need to. Take your break, he said again, and shoved the door open. The air outside was clean and fresh, the night warm and breezy. The minute the door closed behind them, the noise shut down to a muffled, echoing roar, and the stink of smoke, sweat, and beer became a memory. I don't think you should be working here. She gaped at him. The statement itself was odd enough, but to hear him deliver it, in a tone that was obviously annoyed, was baffled. Excuse me? You heard me, Grace. He shoved his hands in his pockets because he didn't know what to do with them. <laughs> Left free, they might have grabbed her again. That's not right. It's not right? She repeated as he, Your mother, for God's sake. What are you doing serving drinks wearing that outfit? Getting a hit on. The guy in there practically had his face down your blouse. Oh, he did not. Tore between amusement and exasperation. She shook her head. For heaven's sakes, Ethan, he was just being typical and harmless. Curtis had his hand on your ass. Amusement was very toward annoyance. I know where his hand was, and if it worried me, I'd have knocked it off. Ethan took a breath. He started this wisely or not. And he was going to finish it. <laughs> you shouldn't be working half naked in some bar or knocking anybody's hand off your ass. You should be home with Aubrey. Their eyes went from mildly irritated Blaine Ferry. Oh! Is that right? Is that your considered opinion? Well, thank you so much for sharing it with me. And for your information, if I wasn't working, and I'm damn well not half naked, I would have, I wouldn't have a home. You've got a job, he said suddenly, cleaning the houses. That's right. I clean houses. I serve drinks, and now and then I pick crabs. That's how amazingly skilled and versatile I am. I also pay rent, insurance, medical bills, utilities, and a babysitter. I buy food. I buy clothes, gas. I take care of myself and my daughter. I don't need you coming around here. It's me. It's not right. I'm just saying. I heard what you're saying. Her heels were throbbing, and every ache in her overtaxed body was making itself known. Worse, much worse, was the hard pick of embarrassment that he would look down on her for what she did to survive. I serve cocktails and let men look at my legs. Maybe they tip better if they like them. And if they tip better, I can buy my little girl something that makes her smile, so they can look all they damn well please. And I wish to God I had the kind of body to fill out this stupid outfit, because then I'd earn more. He had to pause before speaking to gather his thoughts. Her face was flushed with anger, but her eyes were so tired and broken. You're selling yourself short, Grace, he said quietly. I know exactly how much I'm worth, Ethan. Her chin angled. Right down to the last penny. Now, my break's over. She spun on her miserable throbbing heels and stalked back into the noise and the smoke-clogged air. End of chapter 2